Welcome and good evening, Chicago. We're pleased to welcome you to the premiere of Little City TV, the only autism awareness show in Chicago. On behalf of Little City Foundation's Chicago Access Networks, welcome to our series. If you've seen Chicago's light skyscrapers lit up in blue, you might notice or know that April is Autism Awareness Month. And for the next 12 weeks, beginning tonight, we'll feature experts and industry thought leaders in the field of intellectual and developmental disabilities to discuss the fastest growing developmental disability that is unfortunately sweeping our nation, Autism Spectrum Disorder. Right now, Autism Spectrum Disorder affects one in every 110 children throughout our nation. And one out of 63 infants in Illinois are born with a developmental disability like autism. So with this series, we hope to generate awareness for autism and to provide you with answers to some of your pressing questions. But before we kick off our series, please allow me to speak a little bit about Little City Foundation. Little City Foundation is a first-class service provider with more than 350 children and adults that cares for more than 350 children and adults with autism and other intellectual and developmental disabilities. It has offices in Chicago, 16 group homes throughout Chicagoland, and a 56-acre campus in Palatine. Approximately 400 Little City employees provide a host of clinical supports and therapies, including 24-7 residential care, in-home personal and family supports, behavioral intervention, specialized foster care and adoption, recreational and vocational program programming for adults, an award-winning arts program, and more. Tonight, we have the pleasure of hosting Little City's Executive Director, Mr. Sean Jeffers. Mr. Jeffers owns more than 25 years of high-level experience in human services and nonprofit management and became the Executive Director of Little City Foundation in March 2003. Selected for his outstanding ability to provide high-quality leadership and strategic direction, Mr. Jeffers tirelessly champions to attain equality and dignity for children and adults with intellectual and developmental disabilities. He leads a volunteer board comprised of 40 of Chicago's finest public and private sector leaders and paves the path for more than 400 staff in providing groundbreaking, innovative service to hundreds of Illinois' most vulnerable citizens. Mr. Jeffers also manages the 50-year-old agency's $23 million operating budget. A humanitarian in his own right, Mr. Jeffers also participates in various state and local organizations and boards, such as the Illinois Governor's Human Services Commission, Northern Illinois, the uh, Northern Illinois University Division of Public Administration's Board of Advisors, the Progressive Housing Board of Directors, Harper College Human Services Program Advisory Board, and he is a member of the ICE ARC and also teaches nonprofit business management at Northern Illinois University. Thank you so much, Sean. What, what a biography. Thank, Thank you. you so much for joining us on our program today. Well, it's, it's my pleasure. It's definitely my pleasure. Um, before you even get started, Sean, tell us why is Little City doing this? Well, for a number of reasons, uh, Lisa, and I think most importantly, um, we want to do this as a means of collaboration. I think we're speaking today on, on one of the uh, biggest cha human services challenges that in my lifetime that we've faced, and that's the, uh, the onset of, of uh, this very, very mysterious disease called autism. Mm -hmm. And so Little City's desire, because uh, it, it's, we're not the owner of the answer, and I do think that within all of us there are many things that we can share and learn that will advance the field of autism. So our desire over the next 12 weeks, and beginning with this week, uh, uh, counting this week uh, with 13 weeks, is to begin to promote the dialogue, mm -hmm. to bring people from a number of different perspectives who can speak very, uh, I think, faithfully and accurately and passionately mm -hmm. about autism. And so that's the hope, that it becomes a sharing of knowledge and information so that parents can use this as just, again, one of their many resources to help uh, uh, them uh, provide for their loved one the services and supports that they need. Well, thank you for leading this initiative for the yeah. City of Chicago. It looks like we already have a caller on the line. Caller, please go ahead. Caller, please go ahead. Hi there. Um, I just wanted to say, first of all, thank you for what Little City is doing. Um, I have a friend whose child has autism. He's eight years old. I'm just curious to learn a little bit more about what types of services you can provide for somebody like that. Well, I think one of the first things, and I appreciate uh, your, the opportunity to take your call, in the Illinois service system there is a, a need for uh, any family with a child with disabilities to uh, first get on what's called the prioritiz prioritization of unmet uh, um, service needs, the, the PUNS list. 
And if you call Little City Foundation at the number that's listed, what we will make sure, uh, not let me give you that number because it's not on your screen right now, 847, I want you to call me directly at 847-221-7860. Because what we want to first do is get you connected with your local community resource to help get your child on the list. Because Little City is one of many options. I don't want to sit here and suggest that it's the best uh, a place or best opportunity for uh, your loved one or your friend's loved one. That when we speak, uh, particularly with our, our concern about autism, it's, it's a spectrum disorder. There's no one size fits all. There's one, not one program that will meet all needs. So Little City, before we would commit, we want to make sure that you have, have explored all options and have determined us to be the best possible option for your child. Now, to the extent that we are, some of the things that we offer, first and foremost, we want to preserve a child's place in his or her home. And so our first desire would be to work with that family to make sure that the support system is there that doesn't cause a disruption of that child's place in his family or, or his or her community. And then to the extent that it did involve something more intense, such as residential placement, we want that to be a temporary option because the objective is always to keep a child within his or her home and within his or her community. And so to the extent that we, you know, we would hope that we could arrange a service plan through service facilitation and the like that will allow us to assist you in getting the best possible outcome with your child. Whether or not that's working cooperatively with schools, whether or not it's residential placement, whether or not it's other supports, uh, medical supports. We just opened, um, uh, actually a grand opening on May 10th is our, our uh, Center for Health and Wellness. And in our partnership with Northwest Community Hospital, we, be, we are planning to provide a full medical array of, uh, of these services and options for both children and adults with autism. So again, we are one of the steps, uh, I think, in that path leading to uh, a more successful life for that child. So we would encourage you first, give us a call, and we're going to walk you through, personally, the right door to begin to get the services and supports for that child. Excellent, Sean, excellent. Understand that Little City is celebrating its golden anniversary year. It started in October, uh, October last year. Can you tell us how, how Little City was founded and a little bit about the history of Little City? Yeah, one of the, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll kind of set up, Lisa, with these three terms. And those three terms are inspiration, ideation, and implementation. Parents in 1957, when they purchased the land for Little City, were inspired to do something great for their child, for their loved one. Those, that inspiration led to the idea of creating this campus uh, and creating this environment. Because if we, you know, if we go back in, in time, uh, people with disabilities um, had very few options. And one option that, that families face, either you kept your child at home without services and supports, or you sent them off to uh, one of the large state hospitals. Mm -hmm. So not a number. So these parents wanted the same things we would want for our non-disabled child as a, the best possible outcome. So they pulled together their resources and they purchased little, the land that Little City resides on, a little over $40,000, brought 56 wow. acres of land, and set out to, to do um, the best possible environment for them. I know this, um, and I'll, I'll come back to that answer, that we've got a caller who's just waiting uh, to say something. So, okay, got a couple of callers. It's popular right, show great. tonight. Caller, please, you're on the air. Hi, yeah, thank you. I just wanted to ask, um, can you talk a little bit about some of the different uh, intellectual and developmental disabilities that Little City works with? Sure. Great. We're, um, um, well, I'll, I'll speak right, right now with our children's residential program. Uh, over 80% of the children who reside in that program have a um, uh, disorder that's a con consisting of autism spectrum disorder. But as we look to the early population of Little City, um, it was primarily individuals with Down syndrome. Um, and over time, and for many years, Little City's primary population were individuals with Down syndrome and some other co comorbid uh, situations. So now we have kind of full spectrum. We've got uh, individuals who, if we're looking at from the, the, the top end of the, the developmental disability intellectual scale, we've got individuals who operate there, are fully capable of doing many things for themselves, including uh, community living. Also, we have individuals on the far end of that spectrum who have a need for 24-hour care and supervision. 
Within that, what we've also seen over the, the past decade are uh, comorbid situations such as mental health needs, so the notion of dual, duly diagnosed. So our organization is not specific to just autism. Autism is one of, of, of many uh, disorders that we're, we have positioned ourselves to be of service to. But it basically goes full spectrum. My youngest uh, citizen at Little City is uh, six years old. My old, in terms of residential placement, my oldest is 72. So we're going full lifespan. Within our community program, we're serving families who have infants uh, with uh, disabilities. Our foster care adoption program is a specialized entity to provide uh, um, uh, uh, adoption and, and, and um, family supports, and adoption and placement support for individuals who are both infant and through uh, uh, late teens. So it is an organization that I think truly represents the diversity and complexity of serving people with disabilities. All right. All right. Thank you, Sean. Right. Do we have another caller? Okay. All right. While uh, we wait for a few of the calls to um, to uh, log. Um, can I ask you, Sean, I've been seeing the, this puzzle piece around, and it, it apparently is the national symbol for autism. Can you explain why they call autism a mysterious disorder and why the puzzle piece is a symbol for it? Well, there's a, there's a, a couple explanations for that, Lisa. First, if we envision a puzzle, mm -hmm. uh, a puzzle has many individual pieces. In most cases, none of those pieces are alike. And I think that's also indicative of autism. Mm -hmm. If you've seen or know one person with autism, you know one person with autism. Mm -hmm. If you've seen or have a piece of a puzzle, you have one piece of the puzzle, you don't have a whole. So it, the puzzle piece is reflective of both the diversity and the complexity of autism. Mm -hmm. So with all these pieces, it's not a simple thing. So it, it's, it's, you know, it's, it's the mystery of of trying to come up with the right solution for this very complex, diverse population of folks. Mm -hmm. And that's what I, I think, uh, if you also look at the, uh, um, the autism symbol, it represents all kinds of colors. Mm -hmm. So a puzzle piece is not single, again, to, to right. represent that, the whole notion well, of the diversity. Right. Yeah. That's interesting. That's great. Um, it's often scary for a parent who just found out that their child is diagnosed with autism. Often they feel they have nowhere to turn or no one to blame, if that. And you've, uh, as a leader in, the, in this non, you know, nonprofit environment, serving you know, 25 years, you've you've helped a lot of families with individuals that have loved ones with intellectual and developmental disabilities. Do you have any words of comfort for parents that are just finding out their children are diagnosed with autism? Well, I don't know that it's words of, of comfort. And I think particularly we speak at a time now, Lisa, where the state funds mm -hmm. uh, in terms of providing uh, services and supports to people in need, mm -hmm. uh, autism included, mm -hmm. are very much constrained. And so I think parents are right to be fearful. But I think what it calls for is, and, and it's, it's sort of the, I think one of the reasons why we're doing this session, is how do you begin to pull together your resources? How do you become a conduit for the information needs that families have? Just as we described, autism is a spec, if one solution is not going to be the solution for all. And so to the extent that we can become more collaborative as organizations, universities, hospitals, and the like, to help people through this very tough navigating uh, the pathway, um, that's what's going to give them hope. Parents, in this, particularly in this information age, their ability to access and be with someone who can assist them. Our role is not to market Little City as the answer, but it's to help families get to uh, the services that they need for their loved one. That's wonderful. Thank you. Okay, we've got uh, quite a few calls on the line. Caller, please go ahead. You're on the air. Yes, good evening. How are you? Good, uh, thank you. My name is Eddie Williams, and I'm a behavior analyst, certified, uh, board certified uh, behavior analyst. And one of the things that I've been noticing with the dual diagnosed population is the increase in violence, particularly those diagnosed with OD ODD and antisocial behavior. I would like to know, does you little city uh, see an increase um, in certain behaviors um, uh, along those lines, and so also specifically along the lines of uh, sexual oriented behaviors. Well, let me address the, the, the first part, and is how, are we seeing an increase? And the answer is yes. And I, I think, uh, uh, caller, as we look at the, 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 you know, many years ago uh, where community options were few, um, residential growth was astounding. 
And now what we've seen by way of both policy and, and good, uh, I think, good practice is that the residential population, particularly on the developmental disability side, does consist of individuals who have some rather significant challenges, including the things that you described. And so as we look uh, you know, at our population now, particularly our kids, they do present themselves with some very significant behavioral challenges, challenges that I think uh, have uh, uh, become a challenge for the local schools to try and address. Uh, it's challenges by way of preparing a workforce that's capable of doing it. If I go back to the early years of Little City with kids who were primarily Down syndrome higher functioning, those challenges compared to where we are, they're eons apart. They're just light years apart. And so I think there is a need both from, uh, particularly from the university side, and I, I'd love to talk to you further even offline, because we're making a major investment in our ability to respond to those behavioral needs. The whole issue of, of, of uh, the, the sexual issues that you mentioned, very much so I think a challenge once you have people in congregate living arrangements. Uh, which, you know, in and of themselves aren't necessarily the most natural environment. Those issues of sexuality and the, less, and the rest emerge. So, yes, that's part of the profile that we're seeing. We have another call. Caller, please go ahead. You're on the air. Hi, thanks for taking my call. I'm just wondering, with so many kids diagnosed with autism these days, what kind of hope is out there for them? And what will they do as adults? So your question is, what, what kind of hope is there for, for children with autism? How, you know, what will happen when they grow into adults? Well, I think that one is the exposure. Um, you, you can barely get through a, a day or a week without there being um, uh, some discussion uh, about not only the advances in, in the treatment of autism, but it's prevalent. So I do think that efforts like what uh, Lisa and others are promoting now by way of promoting awareness campaigns, um, the fundraising efforts that are going on, I look at the uh, Autism Speaks and the, the, the excellent job that they have done in terms of, of promoting this to a level that there's a national agenda, even to the point that our president is beginning to speak about it, does offer some hope for those families. I think the major key now is how do we align the service network to become more responsive to the needs of those individuals. And I, I think you know, callers like yourself and the, the like who continue to help us promote that agenda are going to, uh, I, I think, just add to a parent's um, um, success in getting the services that their child needs. Sean, I think you should also speak to some of our adults at Little City that have job coaching and have job coaches and we have a vocational program to assist individuals with intellectual and developmental disabilities who do a great job working in the community. Right, I and think the, the, the early intervention is key. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if we're, we're looking to uh, people succeeding as adults, we have to make major investments early in life. Right. Okay. Right. Okay, we've got another caller. Caller, caller uh, please go ahead. You're on the air. Hello, Lisa. Um, my question is, I'm president of McCormick Chamber of Commerce. Lisa, this is Cliff Ruffin. Oh, um, hello. <laughs> I'd like to know how we can work or collaborate you, with you during your annual event. Um, I know during that event, it's uh, a time where you raise funds and you put the word out about your, uh, your services. Uh, we'd like to uh, work with you on that. I, I took down your number so I can call you later, but I'd like to get some idea of, of your time for 2010 in terms of your events. Well, we'll, we'll definitely, I'll let uh, Lisa, as, our, um, as we know, as our communications director, <laughs> and, and this is uh, excellent. You know, you, you just had um, uh, it kind of touched upon an area that I think is very critical. Uh, this issue that we face in terms of service to people is not just a government issue. Mm -hmm. It's all of our issue. Mm -hmm. And to the extent that we can engage the business community, local communities, and the like, uh, in helping us both raise funds and raise awareness, that's the key. And, and I'm, I'm hoping that this session encourages people to get involved. Mm -hmm. And so I, I deeply respect and, and uh, very appreciative of your saying, wait, it doesn't affect me at a personal level. I'm not calling in behalf of a person with disabilities, but as an interested citizen that wants to, to see business and others get more involved in helping us raise uh, both the funds and the profile of, um, of the you know people who need services really appreciate that. Good. Um, before we got uh, interrupted a, a little bit earlier, Sean, when you were telling us a little bit about the history of Little City Foundation, would you mind continuing? But I, I think I stopped at, at the point where parents raise money. And again, it was a little over forty thousand dollars bought. Uh, forty thousand dollars bought fifty-six acres of land. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> try doing it now. Uh, and, and very prime real estate and, and the 
this is prior to the state of Illinois um, or any uh, entity, government entity, uh, having an entitlement to service. So those families had to raise their, you know, private resources. Mm -hmm. This uh, little city at that time was a, a private pay organization. Mm -hmm. um, they engaged uh, um, labor unions and community leaders and built Little City Foundation with the idea, much like Boys Town and other uh, environments of the time, of creating a place where their kids' hopes, dreams, and wishes could be achieved. Now, at that time, Lisa, the idea of a person living with disabilities, living into adulthood, was pretty foreign. If we go back as, as early as the 1930s, 1940s, if you were uh, a young uh, young man with a child, with a, a male child with disabilities, you expect lifespan was 15 years. Mm -hmm. If you were an adult with disabilities, uh, a girl with disabilities, expected lifespan was 22 years. So in 1957, 1959, when Little City uh, opened its doors, the idea of adulthood was kind of a Not foreign existed. notion. Right. I mean, it was maybe into the 30s, folks right. with Down syndrome uh, living into the 30s. But so in, in the 70s, 80s, we, had, we were in the adult business because those children, with the quality of services and supports they received, we're beginning to live longer mm -hmm. life sense. Mm -hmm. To right now, a substantial part of my adult population are individuals over the age of 45, 50. Wow. And so we're beginning to see, but what makes that a little bit challenging is the diseases of aging have sooner onsets with people with disabilities. Mm -hmm. So we're beginning to see the dementias, the Alzheimer's mm -hmm. conditions, the orthopedic conditions at a much earlier age, the mm -hmm. dental concerns that, that, that we also have. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of our challenge now is how do we begin to address that and what we've done, we're now in the senior services. Uh, you know, so our, our, our span of services goes from the early years now deep into senior services. Great. That's great. Okay, well, it looks like we have uh, the shows all up. Wow. <laughs> Went by really I, quickly. I Thank you. Say, yeah. <laughs> Thank you much, so much, Chicago, for uh, welcoming us, for welcoming Little City and welcoming Little City TV to uh, to cable casting. And uh, if you have any questions that we did not get to, please log on to www.littlecity.org and uh, submit them to info at littlecity.org and we will answer them. At, we'll do our best to answer them at the next segment. And uh, we look forward to seeing you next Wednesday, 7.30 p.m. on CAN TV 21. Thank you.